Return to the Word is made possible by faithful supporters like you. Find out more at returntotheword.com. Welcome to the broadcast ministry of Return to the Word with Pastor Mark Fontecchio, advancing the message of God's amazing grace through the teaching of God's Word. And now, here is pastor and author Mark Fontecchio. Just a few weeks ago, I told you that Afghanistan had the second fastest rate of Christian growth in the entire world. In light of recent events, the takeover by the Taliban, I wanted to know what was happening to them, to the Christians in particular. The latest report that I was able to find is that the Afghan Christians are fleeing to the mountains right now. They are fleeing to the mountains, not to homes in the mountains, not to little retreats in the mountains, just to the mountains in a desperate, desperate attempt to escape the Taliban. Because, of course, in many places, the Taliban is going door to door trying to kill them. Frontier Alliance International, FAI, a ministry that is dedicated to planting underground churches in the Middle East, is reporting that the Taliban is specifically targeting Christians for death. They said that the Taliban has a hit list of known Christians that they are targeting to pursue and to kill. Now, the Afghan Christians have nowhere to flee to. They have nowhere to take refuge. The borders to neighboring countries are closed. All flights have been halted except those at Kabul. And so the Christians are fleeing into the mountains looking for asylum. They are relying on God who is the only one who can protect them. The Taliban, of course, in many places are starting to go door to door taking women and children. The people in certain cities must mark on their home with an ax if they have a girl over 12 years of age so that the Taliban can take them. And if they find a young girl and the house is not marked, they will execute the entire family. And if a married woman 25 years or older has been found, the Taliban often kills the husband, uses her, and then sells her. These are the reports among the general population that husbands and fathers have given their wives and daughters guns and told them that when the Taliban comes, they can choose to either kill them or they can kill themselves. It's their choice. But in order to catch the Christians, here's what they're doing. The Taliban are looking through people's phones. They're looking through their phones, looking for apps that would give them away as Christians. And Christians are starting to hide all their stuff, their music, everything they have. They demand to see your phone. And if they see a downloaded Bible app on your phone, they will kill you on the spot immediately. And the Taliban have spies and informants everywhere. And so it's dangerous to be in the company of other Christians. Now, most Afghan believers are totally alone. They dare not attend a house church because who do you trust? How much do you trust the person sitting next to you? They're alone. They're scared. And they're asking the mission agencies for help. FAI released a video from one of the members of the underground church in Afghanistan and he wept as he described the situation. His face in the video online is blurred for his own protection. His words from this past week, and I quote, we are unable to control our emotions because we've worked so hard for 20 years. All of our work over the past 20 years has been lost overnight. Only God understands how much pain we have and how broken our hearts are. We are not crying out for fear. Key point, he says, we're not crying out for fear but because our hearts ache for our beautiful country. It has now been destroyed by this savage extremist group. The whole world has abandoned us. But then he said this, we are not leaving the field. We will fight harder and we will continue in God's work. He added that they were recording the video so that the church in Afghanistan would be remembered if they completely wiped out and killed the church of Jesus Christ in that country if they were killed for their faith. Then he asked for our prayers. He asked for help taking care of their children when these Christian parents are killed. He said, please take care of them. And then he just said this, I'm sorry I cried. I'm sorry I became emotional, but my heart hurts. Would you join me in praying for those heading to the hills? 
to be protected. We pray for those Christians remaining behind, that they will have the strength and endurance because some Christians, here's boldness of faith, some are still meeting. Some are still continuing to meet for their faith in Jesus Christ. Help them, Lord. Some are still leading Bible studies, prayer meetings. Some are being so bold that they're going out and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ right now with the Taliban hunting them down, they're sharing Christ. Pray for their boldness in this darkest hour. Pray that God would provide for their needs. Pray that the remnant in Christ in our country wakes up before it's too late. Pray. And of Christians, this morning, I want you to recognize something, that we are in a fight, but we're in the good fight of faith. This morning... We are going to be looking at Paul's final instructions to Timothy in his first letter. Turn with me, if you would, to 1 Timothy 6. And before we get to verse 11, let's look at verse 12. He says, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, to which you are also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Now, this is a key statement in our text. It sums up the final charge to Timothy. Fight the good fight of what? Faith. It's some of the same wording that Paul used back in chapter 1, where he said, This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, having faith and a good conscience. It's almost like Paul is bookending it, putting this teaching in chapter 1 and in chapter 6, telling Timothy, you're in a war. You're in a battle. You are in a fight. And that is what I want us all in this room to realize this morning, that you are involved in a spiritual battle, and it impacts every single one of us in this room, whether you know it or not. See, the Bible's clear on this one. The Bible's abundantly clear on this one. We're at war. We are not at peace in this world. So get that out of your head. This is a command, Christian. Fight the good fight of faith. Defend the biblical doctrine of faith. Propagate the biblical doctrine of faith. Agonize over it is the wording. Now, Paul is not asking us to do anything other than how he lived his own life. How did he end in 2 Timothy 4, 7? He said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have what? Kept the faith. I wonder if that is what you'll be able to say on your last days on this earth. Paul had shared Jesus Christ. He had defended the faith, and Paul was saying, my time on earth is short. So Timothy, continue the fight. Lay hold on eternal life. Now, don't misunderstand these words as you look at this text. This is not telling Timothy to get eternal life. That's not it. And it's not even Paul telling Timothy to keep eternal life, as if Timothy could lose his salvation. That's not it either. He's telling Timothy, you're in a fight. Oh, you're in a war. You're in a battle. So grab on to your faith. It's about living for Jesus Christ now. It's about understanding our identity and position in Christ, and then living it out in our condition. This is the life given to the believer at the moment of regeneration. Live according to who you are in Jesus Christ. Live according to that position you have in Christ. Because, Timothy, you were called by God to salvation. You have been justified by the righteousness of Christ. Paul spoke of this. Paul spoke of this in 2 Timothy 1.9. Look at what he said. Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. Timothy, God called you to salvation. It started there. Then you made a confession of faith in the presence of many witnesses. Now, confession of faith just simply means you have a testimony that you believed in Christ. Paul is referring here to a testimony after receiving Jesus Christ, probably referring to when Timothy was baptized or Timothy's confession when he was being persecuted. It's not a separate step of salvation. That's not what's happening here in the Bible. Don't add another step to the gospel of Christ that is not found in scriptures. You do not have to confess audibly Christ in order to receive eternal life. It's by faith alone and Christ alone. Life has been imparted to us by Christ. So start living like it, Christian, because you're in a fight for the very truth of Christ in a world that hates Jesus Christ. 
Stop putting your faith last in your life. Put your faith first. Stop living with one foot in the world and one in Christ because you're in a fight. So quit coasting in your faith. See, Paul's saying there's a deeper experience in the Christian life, so grab onto it. Hold on to it. Don't forsake your gathering with the body of Christ. Don't forsake your witness for Christ. Don't forsake your prayer. Don't forget about reading the Word of God because a deeper faith should drive you deeper into these things. There's a beautiful fellowship that comes from walking with Jesus Christ that depends on Christ. And Paul is highlighting the fact that some Christians, they have eternal life, but they never really grab hold of it. They sit there stunted like little children. Your growth in Christ is not automatic. So get into the fight, Christians. Find the joy that comes from obedience to Jesus Christ. It's not going to be easy. It's not. But there's a reward that comes. Before I hurt this knee right there, I used to jog. I used to love to jog. I used to love to run races. And when you race, you don't stop running when you feel pain in your muscles. You don't. The pain is actually a part of the growth as a runner. You run until you don't think you can run anymore, but you keep on running. And then your lungs start to hurt and you, your feet start to feel like lead, lead weights. And then you see that finish line in the race and you reach down and you find a strength that you didn't even know you had and you begin to pick up speed as you cross that finish line. It's the exact same thing with the Christian life, isn't it? It is. But you find a strength to continue where? In Jesus Christ. In Christ. To fight the good fight is the call of every generation of believers. Hebrews 12, 4 teaches us that we are at a war against sin. 1 Peter 2, 11 says our flesh is at war against our souls. In 2 Timothy, Paul tells Timothy that we are soldiers for Jesus Christ. In the second letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthians, two different times, Paul talks about how we as Christians have weapons that we are to fight with. And then, and then you know Ephesians 6.12 where Paul says this, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Now, hear me on this. There's a spiritual battle raging, and it looks different different in each one of our lives. See, some of us are going to be attacked for our faith. Some of us are in a battle for their marriage. Some of us are in a battle for their purity of their children or battles for purity in their own lives, battles with our thoughts or worry about our futures, battles for the truth of Christ. And then you need to know that in this war, in this battle that we are in, the enemy is formidable. See, there's spiritual forces of evil. There is pure evil in this world, pure evil in the heavenly realms who make it their goal to defame the glory of God, to distort the gospel of Christ, and to destroy God's people. Do you believe that? Because that's what Paul's saying. There's an adversary who wants to wreck your marriage. There is. There's an adversary who wants to ruin your relationships, attack your purity, and at all costs, keep you from knowing the goodness and glory of God and spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He is your enemy. He is not God, but no matter how smart or how strong you think you are, you are no match for him apart from Jesus Christ. Now, you don't get a choice in this. You do not choose whether or not you're going to be a part of this spiritual war. You are born in the middle of it. You cannot ignore it. You can try, but you won't stand for Christ. You will waver in your faith. Your life will be a mess because spiritual retreat leads to spiritual defeat. So fight the good fight of faith. Stand for the doctrines of Christ. Stand for his truth. Stand for the gospel. This is a good fight. So here's what I want us to do. I want you as a Christian, as a believer, to think about where the fight is being waged in your life right now. Don't think about anybody else. Think about where you're fighting the battle and then look at Paul's instruction about this. Because here's what Paul did. 
He surrounded the statement to fight the good fight with imperative verbs, commands, in other words, for Timothy to know how to fight this fight. And the first one was back in verse 11, to flee from evil, where he said, but you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. See, Paul called Timothy a man of God because he was a person whose life was centered in God and controlled by him. A man that knew Christ is the very essence of our lives. Flee these things. What things? Flee all the things listed before this in chapter 6, including the love of money, the pride of man, greed, envy, disputes in the church, evil suspicions. Flee from the moral pollution of our day. It is to obey the teaching of Romans 13, 14, which says, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. The command by Paul is to flee the things that are chasing the believer constantly in your life. The things that are literally chasing after you. Think of an animal that you hate. I don't care what it is. Think of an animal that you hate. Micah, you hate spiders and snakes. I know that about you. He's less scared of bears and moose than spiders and snakes. It's it's true. But maybe for you, it's a bear. For me, I had... I call him Bob, but Bob was this moose that every time I was biking this week, Bob kept showing up out there and he was driving me nuts and he's kind of ornery. He's a big bull moose. Okay. But think of an animal you're really, really afraid of. And if you came around a corner and and found yourself facing this animal that you don't like, what would you want to do? You'd want to run. You'd want to get away from it. Paul is saying as a believer in Christ, that is how you should feel about greed. That is how you should feel about lust. That is how you should feel about jealousy, injustice like we see in Afghanistan. Now think about how you would feel as a person if you saw the person that you love best in this world. For me, that's Angie Baby. You haven't seen them in a long time, but now they're walking through the airport gates. What do you do? You go to them. You run right to them. You'd go to them immediately. That's how you're supposed to be thinking about your life in Jesus Christ and the life that he's given you in this world. See, flee the things, run from those things that tempt us to sin. Flee the things that hurt us. Flee the things that hurt others in the body of Christ. But run to who? Jesus Christ. Flee and run. Pursue or learn to live out in condition who Christ has made you to be with purity, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness, fruit of the spirit. In other words, that comes by what? The power of the spirit of God living in you comes by living in fellowship with Jesus Christ. Paul is telling us that not all unity is good. There's an ecumenical unity that is not good. There is a time, Christian, when bad doctrine or immoral living means we need to actually take a step back and stand on our own for Jesus Christ. You flee from the evil that pulls you from God. You fight by fleeing. Because sin always starts slowly. And it's very subtle at first. Maybe it's just one glance. Maybe it's just one thought. Just one purchase. Just one minute of sin. Paul says, run from these things. Whenever you have a desire that pulls you from God, it's faith centered in Christ. It's a life that revolves around God. That should be your focus. You run from those things and you focus on Christ. Saturate your mind, he says, your heart, your life with God. Chase after that deeper trust with God. Which takes us back to verse 12 to lay hold onto that eternal life. As a believer in Christ, you have his life. You have the life of Christ, but you struggle to live as he did. Why? Well, the world, the flesh, all these things take us away. It tempts us to wander from Jesus Christ. But we know there's coming a day in the future when we are going to experience a life that Christ has bought us in all its fullness, where we are free from sin, And Paul is telling Timothy, as you fight these spiritual battles in your life, remember that he has called your name, that you, Christian, belong to him. You are his child, so live in God's presence, which is what he starts saying in verse 13, where he says, I urge you in the sight of God who gives life to all things and before Christ Jesus, who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate. 
that you keep this commandment without spot, blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ appearing. Paul is telling Timothy to live in sight of God, live in sight of the God who gives life, and live in sight of Christ Jesus who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate. It's a reference to the trial of Christ before Pilate. Now Jesus answered to Pilate in John 18, 37, where he said this, you say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Jesus testified and defended the truth of God's redemptive purpose, even though he knew he was about to be crucified. Jesus testified of God's plan. He was a faithful and true witness. He had a good confession. Same wording, by the way, same wording as verse 12 as Timothy's confession, teaching us that in verse 12, confession is not about the gospel. And so Paul is saying to Timothy, God is in control of both life and death. Live like you believe it. Live like you believe it. Timothy, you may have to lay down your life for the sake of the gospel, but you have God's assurance that he will raise you from the dead. So keep the commandments of this epistle without spot, blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ's appearing. Meaning, Timothy, focus on the return of Christ. Don't focus on greed. Don't focus on the endless arguments of men because the imminent return of Jesus Christ calls us to live according to our identity in Christ, which is what we have here. The teaching, the teaching that Christ could return at any moment, live in light of God's presence. As you fight the battle, know that the author of life, God himself, is with you. You fight with the presence of God in your life. Isn't that a glorious truth from Scripture? You fight these battles with the presence of God in your life. He didn't leave you empty-handed, did he? This is the Savior who died for you. The Savior who died for you stands beside you in the battle. He's there with you. He is the king that is coming back for you. So what do you, Christian, have to fear? We fight the good fight of faith with our eyes fixed on the sky, looking for, longing for the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he says this in verse 15 which he will manifest in his own time. He who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, who no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Amen. I stand in awe of you. That's what he's saying. I stand in awe of you. Here's what I love about what Paul does next. He just breaks out into praise. Paul couldn't help himself. Paul had to worship God. He says the time of Christ's return is only known to God. Now, verse 15 sounds like Paul is talking about Jesus Christ. Verse 16 sounds like Paul is talking about God the Father. So who is he talking about? And the answer is yes. Yes. But I think here's what Paul was really doing, okay? I think what he was doing is just praising the triune God who is Father, Son, and Spirit. He who is the blessed and only potentate. The idea is the only one who has the ability and power to rule. He is the one true God. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. Immortal because God is self-existent. He has life in himself. God's eternal habitation is the light. What does 1 John 1, 5 say? It says... It says that God himself is light and in him is no darkness at all. He is morally transparent. He is perfectly holy. And so therefore, he is unapproachable. The brightness of his eternal being prevents his creation from drawing close to him. No man has seen God at any time. John 1.18 No man, be careful here with doctrine, No man has ever looked upon the triune God in his eternal presence, in his spiritual omnipresence. In the Old Testament, certainly God made himself manifest known to men in a local manifestation of God. Men saw him as he appeared, not as he is in his eternal state. No one can see him. Jesus Christ has declared him to us. But that is not, Christians, the same as to say that men can see the omnipresent triune God in all his glory. 
Those are different. To whom be honor and everlasting power. Get to know the God of the Bible. I don't care what you see on YouTube or Netflix or anything like that. Get to know the God of the Bible and learn to serve him with complete humility before him. See, God has no beginning and God has no end. And out of his life comes all other life. God is beyond time. He is deathless. He is beyond our comprehension. What a great picture. He dwells in holiness, purity, and glory. He's unapproachable and inconceivable. He's greater than anyone can imagine. He deserves all the praise. This is the God of your life. So what in this world can separate you, Christian, from his love? And you know the answer. Nothing. Nothing can take you out of his sovereign plan from your life. Nothing can take away the hope that we have in Christ. There's no sickness. There's no terrorist. There's no government. No one that can separate you from the love of Christ. So grab hold of your faith. Grab hold of the life that he gives. And so, yes, Timothy, yes, Christian, your calling is immense. It's huge. But the God you serve is far greater and he'll enable you to do it. So you live in awe of God's greatness. And when you feel weak, when you feel tired, when you feel frustrated, you look unto Jesus Christ. Then take a look at verse 17. Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. Now, I've wondered many times before what Paul is doing here because verse 16 would have been the perfect place to end that letter when he says, amen. So why go back and talk about what to do with the riches of the world? Why go back to talk about this? But actually, if you look at this, it makes perfect sense because Paul was just reiterating what he said before in verse 6, where he said, now godliness with contentment is great gain. A man once invited Charles Spurgeon to come preach to a country church as the guest speaker. Spurgeon was asked specifically to give his best sermon he had. Give him the best one you got because the church had a debt that needed to be paid. The man thought Spurgeon's ability to preach and his celebrity status would move the congregation to give and help pay off the debt. And the man wrote this in the invitation. He said, please come and feel at home. You can make use of my town home. You can make use of my country estate or my seaside villa. Spurgeon wrote back, I will not accept your invitation. Sell one of your homes and retire the debt. It reminds me of the rich young ruler in Matthew 19. Christ told him to go sell his possessions and give to the poor. But he was grieved because why? Text says he owned much. But it's had me thinking lately. Because no matter how much wealth that man had, he could not ride in a car. He couldn't have a surgery if he needed it. He could not turn on a simple light switch. He could not buy penicillin. He didn't watch TV. He couldn't wash dishes in running water. He couldn't type a letter, use a computer, use a phone, mow a lawn, fly in an airplane, sleep on a nice mattress, talk on a cell phone. If he was rich, then what am I? And if he was rich, what are you? Command those rich in this present age not to be haughty. Don't be prideful. Pride can become the curse of the rich. It's the curse of the Western church. Because rich people tend to think that they're a little better because they have more. Wealth makes us think it can provide for security, power, and influence, which leads to pride. But even having wealth doesn't mean that you have God's favor. Moses warned about this in Deuteronomy 8. He says in verse 18, And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you the power to get wealth. Any wealth you have is by the grace of God. Were you born into the United States of America? That's grace. Were you raised in a Christian home? That's grace. Were you blessed with good health? Grace. Did you have excellent teachers along the way that gave you a good education? 
grace? And did you meet some people in your lives along the way that helped you to get where you are today? That too, friends, is not because of you. That is God's amazing grace. So you don't trust in uncertain riches. Trust in the living God. He is the one who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Now, the value of hope, when you place your hope in something, the value of hope rests on the strength of the object in which it is placed. When you put your hope in material things, your hope is on the uncertainty of wealth. Because no man can know the plan of God. No man can know what is going to come down the pipeline of history, whether there's going to be wars, inflation, or death. So God determines our future, not our bank accounts. Solomon got this. He warned in Proverbs 11, 28, he who trusts in his riches will what? Fall. So set your trust upon God. Hope must be in a living person. God is the one who provides all that a man needs. Let them do good, rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come. I want you to think about what he is saying here. Almost every American by the world standards would fall into the category of what Paul meant by rich. We are the wealthiest people the world has ever, ever known. And he's saying a rich person should put his money to work. To see everything entrusted to you by God as a divine stewardship and an opportunity to advance the work of Christ. God has given us great wealth, absolutely, but not because we're better. Not because we're better, but because he has entrusted it to us to use it for his work on earth. Suppose someone goes into a big art museum And he begins to take the pictures off the wall. And he carries them underneath his arm. And you go up to him and say, what are you doing? And he answers back. He says, I'm becoming an art collector. But they're not really yours, you say to him. And besides, they're not going to let you out the door with those. You'll have to go out just like you came in without them. But he answers again, sure, they're absolutely mine. I've got them underneath my arm. Look, I got them right there. People see me with them here and think of me as an important art dealer. I don't even bother myself with thoughts about leaving this place. Now, we would rightly call this man a fool, out of touch with reality. And so is the person who spends himself to get rich in this life, because we're going to go out just the way we came in. God expects us to use some of the money he's entrusted to us to provide for our families. Absolutely. He also expects us to use what we can to further the work of Jesus Christ. See, God doesn't care if you have a few nice things to enjoy. Notice Paul even says in verse 17, who gives us richly all things to what? Enjoy. Paul does not follow the communistic line of denying personal property and wealth. And Paul does not condemn rich men because they are rich, but he does warn them of the false trust in riches that often develops. See, it's not a sin to be rich, and it's not godly to be poor. But the issue comes down to the temptations to be greedy when you are rich. To think that you're wealthy because of your own success rather than the blessing of God. The temptation to think that you can get by without God. I love what what Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 9. He says, thus says the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might, nor let the rich man glory in his riches. But let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord exercising loving kindness, judgment and righteousness in the earth. For in these I delight, says the Lord. God doesn't want your guilt offering. God wants his people to give because their hearts are right before him. And so Christians give willingly, give purposefully, because you want to support the work of Christ, which is why Paul taught the church of Corinth that God loves a cheerful giver. Store up treasures in heaven, a good foundation for the time to come, because the more you give to the work of Christ here, the more deposits that you have in heaven, that they may lay hold on eternal life. 
When a believer lives for eternity, he better enjoys the reality of eternal life in the present. You can enjoy the eternal life now. God gives good things, so receive them gratefully from the Father. Be content because it frees us up to be generous when we give. See, we don't need more stuff in this country. We need God. Ask yourself the tough questions. Here they come. Which concerns me more? How much money I have or how much of me does God have? Do I pray more about God supplying material things than I do pray about developing my own character in Jesus Christ? Am I confident about the future because of my bank account being healthy or because my life is secure in Christ? And so Paul concludes this letter to Timothy with this command. He says, oh, Timothy, guard what has committed to your trust, avoiding the profane and idle babblings and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. By professing it, some have strayed concerning the faith. Grace be with you. Amen. The profane and idle babblings, the contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge, not science, as the King James states, it should be knowledge. False knowledge and profane babblings, avoid them because they lead people astray. Some people love to argue endless disputes with those who have doctrines that deviate from Jesus Christ. Even believers who have strayed, strayed concerning the faith, he says, avoid them. Because the church of Jesus Christ is always constantly under attack from a false knowledge that is destructive. Paul is saying doctrine matters. What you believe matters. What you teach matters. What you tell others about Jesus Christ matters. And if we're not on guard, it will lead people astray. See, people don't like it. People don't like being corrected from the word of God. Let me tell you that firsthand experience. They don't like it. I have people all the time that want to bring strange doctrines into this church and they don't like it. When I tell them that their doctrine that they're trying to bring into this place does not match the scriptures. But see, I'm commanded to guard what has been committed to my trust. Guard the deposit, Paul says. Guard the pure faith of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So if you want to bring doctrines in that don't match the word of God, I will tell you they don't match the word of God. You're not going to get very far here. The apostolic teaching... That faith handed down in scriptures. Christians, you guys, guard the deposit entrusted to you because this is the essence of the fight of faith. We fight to be faithful to the gospel. You know, I, I've been thinking about this a lot this week and I had someone in the church tell me, I just want to learn more of the word of God because I'm scared what's coming in this country and we may not be able to meet 10 years from now. And I don't want to depend on someone else. I want to know the word of God so I can lead my family if we can't meet. Guard it. Learn it. Get to know the word of God while you can. Paul is saying this to Timothy. Paul is saying it to Timothy, the pastor of the church at Ephesus, the man he'd worked with for years. Timothy had been faithful. There's nothing in the word of God that indicates Timothy had been unfaithful. But yet Paul warned him, hold on to the faith. And this should be a wake up call for every Christian because there are dangers out there in our faith. And the temptation is to stray, always stray from the doctrines of Christ. That's the temptation. You know, our country is littered with churches that used to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's churches that used to hold fast to the word of God, but they've wandered into all sorts of liberal theology, garbage, questioning the very character of God, denouncing the glory of God, or even ignoring the word of God so people can now gather and hear a TED talk or a devotion by one man's opinions rather than the word of God. And I'll tell you, this same thing could easily happen here if we don't, as a church body, hold fast to the truth of God's word. See, I'm telling you this, there's coming a day, and it could be tomorrow, it could be 20 years from now, when I will not be the pastor of this church. And then this church could just go and become another sad church that used to preach the gospel, used to teach the word of God. So learn what I'm teaching you now, Christians, so that the next man up serving here, you can hold him accountable to the gospel of Christ, to the word of God, so this church can stand. A man by the name of Robert Fulgham, he told the story that hit me because I have a young daughter. He told the story of when his daughter was a little girl and gave him a paper bag to take with him to work. Now, when he asked what was in the bag, she answered, just some stuff. Take it with you. 
Well, when he sat down for lunch at his desk, he pulled out the paper bag and he started pouring out all its contents. It's the bag of a child. So what's in there? Well, two ribbons, three stones, a plastic dinosaur. That's cool. A plastic dinosaur, a pencil stub, a tiny seashell, used lipstick, gross, two chocolate kisses, and 13 pennies. Well, he chuckled a little bit. He finished his lunch, and then he put it all into the wastebasket. And when he got home that evening, his daughter asked the ominous question, where's the bag, Daddy? He replied, truthfully, he left it at the office. And then he asked why. Well, she said, those are my things, Daddy, the things I really, really like. And I thought you might like to play with them. But now I want them back. Well, she saw Robert hesitate. Kids aren't dumb. She saw it. Big tears started forming in her eyes. You didn't lose the bag, Daddy, did you? Well, after she went to bed, Robert raced back to the office and he said this. Molly had given me her treasures, all that a seven-year-old holds dear. Love in a paper sack, and I missed it. Not just missed it. I'd thrown it away. So I went back to my office. I dumped all the waste baskets onto my desk. And I, he eventually found that bag. He put everything back in it. Two ribbons, three stones, a plastic dinosaur, a pencil stub, a tiny seashell, used lipstick, still gross, two chocolate kisses, and 13 pennies. And he took the bag home. And then he sat with Molly. And he had her tell him the story behind every single treasure that she had in the bag. And Robert then said, to my surprise, Molly gave me the bag once again, several days later, same ratty little bag, same stuff inside. And I felt forgiven. And over several months, the bag went with me from time to time. And it was never really clear to me why I did or did not get this bag on certain days. But in time, Molly turned her attention to other things, lost interest in the game, and grew up. Me... I was left holding the bag, literally. She gave it to me one morning, and she never, ever asked for it back. It sits in my office still, left over from when a child said, Here, this is the best I got. Take it. It's yours. I missed it the first time, but it's my bag now. God has given us the most important thing he could ever give us. He gave us himself. He gave us life. He gave us the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's given us eternal life. And that doesn't start in the future. That started the moment you were regenerated by God. And he wants you to start living that abundant life now. But the responsibility of us all is to guard what has been committed to our trust. It's more precious than the contents in a bag from a seven-year-old girl. So Christians fight for the gospel. Fight for the gospel of Jesus Christ and know that you are never alone. You know, when Paul says in verse 21, it's interesting. He says, grace be with you. Amen. The word you is plural. Now, Paul addressed the letter to Timothy. But when he gets to the very end of the letter, the very end. It's not you, Timothy, grace be with you. It's you, church at Ephesus. Along with Timothy, grace be with you. See, God doesn't intend us to fight this fight of faith alone. Every one of us in this room is facing different battles, every single one of us. But when you get involved and in connect with your brothers and sisters in Christ in the church, you can fight the battle together. You can lock arms with your brothers and sisters in Christ who know you and they know your battles and you can pray with them and you can walk through those battles of life together. See, we are intended as Christians to share our lives together as a body of believers. And we come together as a church family, an army of soldiers for Jesus Christ, saying, oh, we're tired of the battle, absolutely. But our God is great. Our God is great. He's worthy to be praised. He's worthy to be glorified, honored. He's won the battle, and we're going to listen to what he says. See, this is a picture of the church that you see in the word of God. You fight together this fight of faith with grace, with grace amidst you all.
But you can't do this if you're a church hopper. You can't. And you can't do this if you only come once a month. And you can't do this if you don't get involved in the lives of the people in the church. Because the battle is intended to be played out as a body of believers locking arms with a common purpose in Jesus Christ that has been entrusted to us. So Christians, flee the evil that pulls you away from God, but run to Jesus Christ. Experience the life that he's bought for you already. Live in light of his faithfulness. Live in awe of his greatness and guard his gospel. Guard the gospel message with your very life as you live to make his glory known. That's a good fight. That's a faith worth fighting for. Return to the Word Ministries is committed to teaching the full counsel of God's Word and the gospel of Jesus Christ. For more about our ministry, please visit returntotheword.com. Return to the Word is a faith ministry. This means we freely distribute the teaching of the Word of God over the air and online. We do this without charge. If you feel led to support the ministry with a donation to help cover these costs, you may do so on our website, returntotheword.com, or by mailing a donation to Return to the Word, PO Box 879259, Wasilla, Alaska, 99687. Thanks for listening. And we pray that the Word of God will be a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. Join us next time for another edition of Return to the Word.